Hello and greetings, listeners, wherever you may be in time and space. To continue this reading of Jurgen by James Branch Cabell, originally published in 1919. We're reading from the uh, from the Dover edition. This is chapter three. The garden between dawn and sunrise. Thus it was that Jurgen and the centaur came to the garden between dawn and sunrise, entering this place in a fashion which it is not convenient to record. But as they passed over the bridge, there fled before them screaming, I'm sorry, three fled before them screaming. And when the life had been trampled out of the small furry bodies, which these three had misused, there was none to oppose the centaur's entry into the garden between dawn and sunrise. This was a wonderful garden, yet nothing therein was strange. Instead, it seemed that everything hereabouts was heartbreakingly familiar and very dear to Jurgen, for he had come to a broad lawn which slanted northward to a well-remembered brook, and multitudinous maples and locust trees stood there and there, stood here and there irregularly and were being played with very lazily by an irresolute west wind, so that foliage seemed to toss and ripple everywhere like green spray. But autumn was at hand, for the locust trees were dropping a Dante's shower, I'm sorry, a Dante's shower of small round yellow leaves. Around the garden was an unforgotten circle of blue hills. And this was a place of lucent twilight, unlit by either sun or stars, and with no shadows anywhere in the diffused faint radiancy that revealed this garden, which is not visible to any man except in the brief interval between dawn and sunrise. Why, but it is Count Emmerich's garden at Storesen, said Jürgen, where I used to be having such fine times when I was a lad. I will wager, said Nessus, that you did not use to walk alone in that garden. Well, no, there was a girl. Just so, assented Nessus. It is a local bylaw, and here are those who comply with it. For now had come toward them, walking together in the dawn, a handsome boy and girl. And the girl was incredibly beautiful, because everybody in the garden saw her with the vision of the boy who was with her. I am Rudolph, said this boy, and she is Anne. And are you happy here? asked Jurgen. Oh, yes, sir. We are tolerably happy. But Anne's father is very rich, and my mother is poor, so that we cannot be quite happy until I have gone into foreign lands and come back with a great many lakes of rupees and pieces of eight. And what will you do with all this money, Rudolph? My duty, sir, as I see it, but I inherit defective eyesight. God speed to you, Rudolph, said Jurgen, for many others are in your plight. Then came to Jurgen and the centaur, another boy with the small blue-eyed person in whom he took delight. And this fat and indolent looking boy informed them that he and the girl who was with him were walking in the glaze of the red mustard jar 
which Jurgen thought was gibberish. And the fat boy said that he and the girl had decided never to grow any older, which Jurgen said was excellent good sense, if only they could manage it. Oh, I can manage that, said this fat boy reflectively, if only I do not find the managing of it uncomfortable. Jurgen for a moment regarded him and then gravely shook hands. I feel for you, said Jurgen, for I perceive that you turn the page two are a monstrous clever fellow, so life will get the best of you. But is not cleverness the main thing, sir? Time will show you, my lad, says Jurgen, a little sorrowfully. And God speed to you, for many others are in your plight. And a host of boys and girls did Jurgen see in the garden, and all the faces that Jurgen saw were young and glad and very lovely and quite heartbreakingly confident as young persons beyond numbering came toward Jurgen and passed him there in the first glow of dawn so that all went exulting in the glory of their youth and foreknowing life to be a puny antagonistic antagonist from whom one might take very easily anything which one desired and all passed in couples as though they came from the ark said Jurgen, but the centaur said they followed a precedent which was far older than the ark for in this garden, said the centaur, each man that ever lived has sojourned for a little while with no company save his illusions. I must tell you again that in this garden are encountered none but imaginary creatures and stalwart persons take their hour of recreation here and go hence unaccompanied to become aldermen and respected merchants and bishops, and to be admired as captains upon prancing horses, or even as kings upon tall thrones, each in his station thinking not at all of the garden ever any more. But now and then come timid persons, Jürgen, who fear to leave this garden without an escort, so these must need go hence with one or another imaginary creature to guide them about alleys and bypaths because imaginary creatures find little nourishment in the public highways and shun them. Thus must these timid persons skulk about obscurely with their diffident and skittish guides and they do not even venture willingly into the thronged places where men get hot horses and build thrones. At what, and what becomes of these timid persons, Centaur? Why, sometimes they spoil paper, Jurgen, and sometimes they spoil human lives. Then are these accursed persons, Jurgen considered? You should know best, replied the centaur. Oh, very probably, said Jurgen. Meanwhile, here is one who walks alone in this garden, and I wonder to see the local bylaws thus violated. Now Nessus looked at Jurgen for a while without speaking, and in the eyes of the centaur was so much of comprehension and compassion that it troubled Jurgen. For somehow it made Jurgen fidget and considered this an unpleasantly personal way of looking at anybody. Yes, certainly, said the centaur. This woman walks alone, but there is no help for her loneliness, since the lad who loved this woman is dead. Nessus, I am willing to be reasonably sorry about it. Still, is there any need of pulling quite such a portentously long face. After all, a great many other persons have died off and on, 
and for anything I can see to the contrary, this particular young fellow may have been no special loss to anybody. Again, the centaur said, you should know best. Chapter 4 The Dorothy Who Did Not Understand For now had come to Jurgen and the centaur, a gold-haired woman, clothed all in white and walking alone. She was tall and lovely and tender to regard, and hers was not the red and white comeliness of many ladies that were famed for beauty, but rather it had the even glow of ivory. Her nose was large and high in the bridge, her flexible mouth was not of the smallest, and yet whatever other persons might have said, to Jürgen this woman's countenance was in all things perfect. Perhaps this was because he never saw her as she was, for certainly the color of her eyes stayed a matter never revealed to him, gray, blue, or green, there was no saying, they varied as does the sea. But always these eyes were lovely and friendly and perturbing. Jürgen remembered that. For Jürgen saw this was Count Emmerich's second sister, Dorothy la Desiree, whom Jürgen very long ago, a many years before he met Dame Lisa and set up in business as a pawnbroker, had hemmed an innumerable, in innumerable verses as heart's desire. And this is the only woman whom I ever loved, Jürgen remembered upon a sudden, for people cannot always be thinking of these matters. So he saluted her with such deference as is due to a countess from a tradesman, and yet with unforgotten tremors waking in his staid body. But the strangest was yet to be seen, for he noted now that this was not a handsome woman in middle life, but a young girl. I do not understand, he said aloud, for you are Dorothy, and yet it seems to me that you are not the Countess Dorothy, whom is Heatman Michael's wife. And the girl tossed her fair head with that careless, lovely gesture which the Countess had forgotten. Hickman Michael is well enough for a nobleman, and my brother is at me day and night to marry the man. And certainly Hickman Michael's wife will go in satin and diamonds at half the courts of Christendom, with many lackeys to attend her. But I am not to be thus purchased. So you told a boy that I remember very long ago. Yet you married Heatman Michael for all that, and in the teeth of a number of other fine declarations. Oh, no, not I, said this Dorothy, wondering. I never married anybody, and Heatman Michael has never married anybody either, old as he is, for he is twenty-eight and looks every day of it. But who are you, friend, that have such curious notions about me? That question I will answer just as though it were put reasonably, for surely you perceive I am Jürgen. I never knew but one Jürgen, and he is a young man barely come of age. Then as she paused in speech, whatever was the matter upon which this girl now meditated, her cheeks were tenderly colored by the thought of it, and in her knowledge of this thing her eyes took infinite joy. And Jürgen understood. He had come back somehow to the Dorothy whom he had loved, but departed, and passed, overtaking by the fleet hoofs of centuries, centaurs, was the boy who had once loved this Dorothy, and who had rhymed of her as his heart's desire. 
and in the garden there was of this boy no trace. Instead, the girl was talking to a staid and paunchy pawnbroker of 40 and something. So Jurgen shrugged and looked toward the centaur, but Nessus had discreetly wandered away from them in search of four-leafed clovers. Now the east had grown brighter and its crimson began to be colored with gold. Yes, I have heard of this other Jurgen, says the pawnbroker. Oh, Madam Dorothy, but it was he that loved you. No more than I loved him. The whole summer, through a whole summer, have I loved Jurgen. And the knowledge that this girl spoke a wondrous truth was now to Jurgen a joy that was keen as pain. And he stood motionless for a while, scowling and biting his lips. I wonder how long the poor devil loved you. He also loved for a whole summer, it may be. And yet again, it may be that he loved you all his life. For 20 years and for more than 20 years, I have debated the matter and I am as well informed as when I started. But friend, you talk in riddles. Is not the custom, is not that customary when age talks with youth? For I am an old fellow in my forties, and you, as I know now, are near eighteen, or rather four months short of being eighteen, for it is August. Nay, more it is the August of a year I had not looked ever to see again. And again, Dom Manuel reigns over us, that man of iron whom I saw die so horribly. All this seems very improbable. And Jurgen meditated for a while. He shrugged. Well, and what could anybody expect me to do about it? Somehow it has befallen that I who am but the shadow of what I was, now walk among shadows, and we converse with the thin intonations of dead persons. For Madame Dorothy, you who are not yet eighteen, in the same in this same garden, there was once a boy who loved a girl, with such love as it puzzles me to think of now. I believe that she loved him. Yes, certainly it is a cordial, it is a cordial to be tired and battered. Yes, certainly it is a cordial to the tired and battered heart, which nowadays pumps blood for me to think for a little while, for a whole summer, these two were as brave and calmly and clean a pair of sweethearters as the world has known. Thus Jürgen spoke, but his thought was that this was a girl who equal for loveliness and delight was not to be found between two oceans. Long and long ago, that doubtfulness of himself, which was closer to him than his skin, had fretted Jürgen into believing the Dorothy he had loved was but a piece of his imaginings. But certainly this girl was real, and sweet she was, and innocent she was, and light of heart and feet, beyond the reach of any man's inventiveness. No, Jurgen had not invented her, and it strangely contented him to know as much. Tell me your story, sir, says she, for I love all romances. Ah, my dear child, but I cannot tell you very well of just what happened. As I look back, there is a blinding glory of green woods and lawns and moonlit nights and dance music and unreasonable laughter. I remember her hair and eyes and the curving and the feel of her red mouth. 
and once when I was bolder than ordinary. But that is hardly worth raking up at this late date. Well, I see these things in memory as plainly as I now seem to see your face. But I can recollect hardly anything, she said. Perhaps now I think of it, she was not very intelligent and said nothing worth remembering. But the boy loved her and was happy because her lips and heart were his. And he, as the saying is, had plucked a diamond from the world's ring. True, she was a count's daughter and the sister of a count. But in those days, the boy quite firmly intended to become a duke or an emperor or something of that sort. So the transient discrepancy did not worry them. I know why Jurgen is going to be a duke too, says she very proudly, though he did think a great while ago before he knew me of being a cardinal. on account of the robes, <clears throat> but cardinals are not allowed to marry, you see. And I am forgetting your story, too. What happened then? They parted in September. With what vows, it hardly matters now. And the boy went into Gitani to win his spurs under the old Vinima de Soyakar. And presently, Oh, a good while before Christmas came the news that Dorothy La Desiree had married rich Heitman Michael. <clears throat> but that is what I am called. And as you know, there is a Heitman Michael who is always plaguing me. Is that not strange? For you tell me all this happened a great while ago. <clears throat> Indeed, the story is very old. And old it was when Methuselah was teething. There is no older and more common story anywhere. As the sequel, it would be heroic to tell you this boy's life was ruined. But I do not think it was. Instead, he had learned all of a sudden that which is, which at 21 is hardly knowledge. <clears throat> that that was the hour which taught him sorrow and rage and sneering, too, for a redemption. Oh, it was armor that hour brought him and a humor to use it because no woman now could hurt him very seriously. No, never anymore. Oh, the poor boy, she said, divinely tender and smiling as a goddess smiles, not quite in mirth. Well, women, as he knew, by experience now, were the pleasantest of playfellows. So he began to play. Rampaging through the world, he went in the pride of his youth and in the armor of his heart, of his hurt, and songs he made for the pleasure of kings, and sword play he made <clears throat> for the pleasure of men, and a whispering he made for the pleasure of women, in places where renown was and where he trode boldly, giving pleasure to everybody in those fine days. But the whisperings and all that followed the whisperings was his best game and the game he played for the longest while with many brightly colored playmates who took the game more seriously than he did. And their faith in the game's importance and in him and his high sounding nonsense, he very often found amusing. And in their other chattels too, he took his natural pleasure. Then, when he had played sufficiently, he held a consultation with diverse waning appetites, and he married the handsome daughter of an estimable pawnbroker in a fair line of business, and he lived with his wife very much as two people customarily lived together. So all in all, I would not say his life was ruined. 
why, then it was, said Dorothy. She stirred uneasily with an impatient sigh, and you saw that she was vaguely puzzled. Oh, but somehow I think you are a very horrible old man, and you seem doubly horrible in that glittering queer garment you are wearing. No woman ever praised a woman's handiwork, and each of you is particularly severe upon her own. But you are interpreting the saga. I do not see, and those large bright eyes of which the color was so indeterminable and so dear to Jurgen seem even larger now, but I do not see how these could well, how there could well be any more. Still human hearts strive the benediction of the priest. <laughs> Still human hearts survive the benediction of the priest, as you may perceive any day. This man at least inherited his father-in-law's business and found it quite as he had anticipated, the fittest of vocations for a cashiered poet. And so I suppose he was content. Ah, yes, but after a while, Heitman Michael returned from foreign parts, along with his lackeys and plate and chest upon chest of merchandise and his fine horses and his wife. And he who had been her lover could see her now after so many years, whenever he liked. She was a handsome stranger, that was all. She was rather stupid. She was nothing remarkable one way or another. This respectable pawnbroker saw that quite plainly. Day by day, he writhed under the knowledge. Because, as I must tell you, he could not retain composure in her presence even now. No, he was never able to do that. The girl somewhat condensed her brows over this information. You mean that he still loved her? Why, but of course. <clears throat> My child, says Jurgen, now with a reproving forefinger, you are an incurable romanticist. The man disliked her and despised her. At any event, he assured himself that he did. Well, even so, this handsome, stupid stranger held his eyes and muddled his thoughts and put errors into his accounts. And when he touched her hand, he did not sleep that night as he was used to sleep. Thus he saw her day after day. And they whispered that this handsome and stupid stranger had a liking for young men who aided her artfully to, to deceive her husband. But she never showed any such favor to the respectable pawnbroker. For youth had gone out of him. And it seemed that nothing in particular happened. Well, that was his saga. About her, I do not know. And I shall never know. But certainly she got the name of deceiving Heitman Michael with two young men or with five young men, it might be, but never with a respectable pawnbroker. I think that is an exceedingly cynical and stupid story, observed the girl. And so I shall be off to look for Jurgen, for he makes love very amusingly, says Dorothy, with the sweetest, loveliest, meditative smile that ever was lost to heaven. And a madness came upon Jurgen there in the garden between dawn and sunrise, and a disbelief in such injustice as now seemed incredible. No, heart's desire, he cried, I will not let you go, for you are dear and pure and faithful, and all my evil dream, wherein you were a wanton and befooled me, was not true. Surely mine was a dream that can never be true so long as there is any justice upon earth. Why, there is no imaginable God who would permit a boy to be robbed of that which 
in my evil dream was taken from me. And still, I cannot understand your talking about this dream of yours. Why, it seemed to me I had lost the most of myself, and there was left only a brain which played with ideas, and a body that went delicately down pleasant ways. And I could not believe as my fellows believed, nor could I love them, nor could I detect anything in aught they said or did save their exceeding folly, for I had lost their cordial common faith in the importance of what use they made of half hours and months and years. And because a Jill flirt had opened my eyes so that they saw too much, I had lost faith and the importance of my own actions, too. There was a little time of which the passing might be made endurable, beyond gaped, unpredictable darkness, and that was all there was of certainty anywhere. <clears throat> now tell me, heart's desire, but was not that a foolish dream? For these things never happened. Why, it would not be fair if these things ever happened. And the girl's eyes were wide and puzzled and a little frightened. I do not understand what you are saying, and there is that about you which troubles me unspeakably. For you call me by the name which none but Jürgen used, and it seems to me that you are Jürgen, and yet you are not Jürgen. But I am truly Jürgen. And look you, I have done what never any man has done before, for I have won back to that first love whom every man must lose, no matter whom he marries. I have come back again, passing very swiftly over the grave of a dream and through the malice of time to my heart's desire. And how strange it seems that I did not know this thing was inevitable. Still, friend, I do not understand you. Why, but I yawned and fretted in preparation for some great and beautiful adventure was to, which was to befall me. By and by, and dazedly, I toiled forward. Whereas behind me all the while was the garden between dawn and sunrise, and therein you awaited me. Now assuredly, the life of every man is a quaintly builded tale, in which the right and proper ending comes first. Thereafter time runs forward, not as schoolmen fable in a straight line, but in a vast closed curve returning to the place of its starting. And it is by a dim foreknowledge of this, by some fate prescience of justice and reparation being given them by and by, that men have heart to live. For I know now that I have always known this thing. What else was living good for unless it brought me back to you? But the girl shook her small, glittering head very sadly. I do not understand you, and I fear you, for you talk foolishness, and in your face I see the face of Jürgen, as one might see the face of a dead man <clears throat> drowned in muddied water. Yet I am truly Jürgen, and as it seems to me, for the first time since we were parted, for I am strong and admirable, even I who sneered and played so long, <clears throat> because I thought myself a thing of no worth at all. That which has been since you and I were young together is as a mist that passes, and I am strong and admirable, and all my being is one vast hunger for you, my dearest, and I will not let you go. For you, and you alone, are my heart's desire. 
<clears throat> now the girl was looking at him very steadily, with a small, puzzled frown, and with her vivid, young, soft lips a little parted, and all her tender loveliness was glorified by the light of a sky that had turned to dusty, palpitating gold. Ah, but you say that you are strong and admirable, and I can only marvel at such talking, for I see that which all men see. And then Dorothy showed him the little mirror, which was attached to the long chain of turquoise matrix about her neck. And Jurgen studied the frightened, foolish, aged face that he found in the mirror. Thus drearily did sanity return to Jurgen, and his flare of passion died, and the fever and storm and the impetuous whirl of things was ended. And the man was very weary. And in the silence he heard the piping cry of a bird that seemed to seek for what it could not find. Well, I am answered, said the pawnbroker. And yet I know that this is not the final answer. Dearer than any hope of heaven was that moment when odd surmises first awoke as to the new strange loveliness which I had seen in the face of Dorothy. It was then I noted the new faint flush of suffusing her face from chin to brow, so often as my eyes encountered and found new lights in the shining eyes which were no longer entirely frank in meeting mine. Well, let that be, for I do not love Heitman Michael's wife. It is a grief to remember how we followed love and found his service lovely. It is bitter to recall the sweetness of those vows which proclaimed her mind eternally, vows that were broken in their making by prolonged and unforgotten kisses. We used to laugh at Heitman Michael then. We used to laugh at everything. Thus, for a while, for a whole summer, we were as brave and calmly and clean a pair of sweethearts as the world has known. But let that be, <clears throat> for I do not love Heitman Michael's wife. Our love was fair but short-lived. There is none that may revive him since the small feet of Dorothy trod out this small love's life. Yet when this life of ours, too, is over, this parsimonious life, which can, can allow us no more love for anybody, <clears throat> must we not win back somehow to that faith we vowed against eternity and be content again in some fair-colored realm? Assuredly, I think this thing will happen. Well, but let that be, for I do not love Heitman, Michael's wife. Why, this is excellent hearing, observed Dorothy. Because I see that you are converting your sorrow into the raw stuff of verses. So I shall be off to look for Jürgen, since he makes love quite otherwise, and far more amusingly. And, and again, whatever was the matter upon which this girl now meditated, her cheeks were tenderly colored by the thought of it, and in her knowledge of this thing, her eyes took infinite joy. <laughs> Thus it was for a moment only, for she left Jürgen now with the friendliest light waving of her hand, and she passed from him, not thinking of this old fellow any longer, as he could see, even in the instant she turned from him. And she went toward the dawn in search of that young Jürgen, whom she, who was perfect in all things, had loved, though only for a little while, not undeservedly. Thanks for listening. This will be uh, over on uh, Rorschach channel on YouTube.
go to Rorschach channel, go to YouTube, uh, search for Rorschach channel and subscribe, please. I'm going to drink a whole bunch of water and I will be back to continue this very interesting story. Thanks for